STS-3 is the most challenging and ambitious mission of the orbital flight test program so far. Much needs to be accomplished for it to be a success. Many of the flight test objectives have already been accomplished. A spectacular first launch, then successful second launch of the same spacecraft. Two pinpoint landings, dramatic decreases in vehicle turnaround time, successful on-orbit checkout of the remote manipulator system. And solid evidence Columbia can be used as a scientific platform for Earth observation. The third flight will push the system even further, proving Columbia can also be used for space observation, completing extensive tests of the remote manipulator system, checking out equipment to be used on later flights for medical research and drug manufacturing, testing an unpainted external fuel tank, which costs and weighs less than the two previous tanks, and planning the mission to last seven full days, so that extensive thermal soap tests can be done on the vehicle and its systems. No facility on Earth could simulate the same heating conditions Columbia would experience in the vacuum of space, where temperatures could vary greatly from one end of the orbiter to the other depending on its orientation to the sun. Less than one week before liftoff, heavy rains at Edwards Air Force Base in California flooded Rogers' dry lake bed, making a landing there impossible. It was decided to land the orbiter instead at Northrop Strip, the alternate landing site at White Sands, New Mexico. Northrop Strip is located in the northern part of White Sands National Monument. In the middle of the U.S. Army's White Sands Missile Range. The remoteness of the area, a dry season that alternates with California's rainy season, and the availability of the Army's aircraft tracking network all contributed to NASA's decision to name Northrop Strip as an alternate landing site several years ago. A microwave landing system used by the orbiter during automatically controlled phases of approach and landing, was installed on one runway. And a stiff leg derrick was erected for hoisting Columbia atop the 747 aircraft, which would ferry it back to Florida. But the equipment necessary to safe Columbia after landing and prepare it for its trip back to the Cape was still at Edwards Air Force Base, over 1,000 miles from White Sands. And liftoff was only four days away. A highly organized, pre-planned operation was set in motion by NASA and implemented by the Department of Defense to move the tons of equipment and supplies from California to New Mexico. Two trains were chartered from the Santa Fe Railroad for the journey. The cargo reached El Paso, Texas near sunset the second day. There, the Southern Pacific Railroad took over. When the trains reached Holloman Air Force Base, they were unloaded, and the mobile equipment was driven the remaining 23 miles. The non-mobile cargo was transported by trucks, In concert with this operation, a plan to erect temporary facilities on the remote lake bed for support personnel, news media, and the public was also set in motion. A mobility unit from Holloman Air Force Base was called in to build shelters, barracks, a viewing area five miles from the landing site for the public. and a press area for the news media. Within three days, all construction was complete. Northrop Strip, which before consisted of only a runway and control tower, was now a total encampment, ready to safe Columbia after landing and prepare it for its trip back to Florida. This task could never have been completed without support from both the Army and Air Force. With their help, 
Northrop Strip was now ready to support the landing. The crew for STS-3, Commander Jack Lausma, a Marine Colonel and veteran of the Skylab 3 mission that stayed in space 59 days. The pilot, Air Force Colonel Gordon Fullerton. This was his first time in space. Fullerton was given primary responsibility for the extensive remote manipulator system tests done on this flight. Jack Lausma, who is serving as commander for this flight, was one of the 19 astronauts selected by NASA in April of 1966. He served as a member of the astronaut support crew for Apollo 9, 10, and 13. And on July 28, 1973, he was launched aboard a Saturn 1B as the pilot for the Skylab 3 crew. His crew logged a total of 1,427 hours and nine minutes in space, setting a new world record for a single mission at that time. He also spent 11 hours and two minutes outside the spacecraft in two separate EVAs or extravehicular activities. He is a colonel in the Marine Corps. Gordon Fullerton became a NASA astronaut in September of 1969, following the first landing on the moon. He is a member of the astronaut support crews for Apollos 14 and 17, and was also a member of the two-man crews who piloted the shuttle orbiter Enterprise on the approach and landing test during 1977. Fullerton is an Air Force colonel. Both astronauts are married. Lazma has three children and Fullerton two. We're able to get up uh, around uh, five or six in the morning, get uh, suited up, make sure our uh, suits worked okay, and uh, walk out. waving to the crowd. In addition to the uh, KSC workers, there is also the press photographers who are assembled and watching them climb into the vans along with the cooling equipment that they carry to keep their suits cool uh, while they are on the ground. We took one big one look at the uh, big bird just before he walked into it, got in the uh, swing arm and walked across and got strapped in. Helped the ground crew check out the spacecraft and uh, promptly at 11 she lifted off. From uh, my right-hand window, uh, lying on, on the back, this is the view, if you turned your head 90 degrees to the right and watched, had a camera pointed out that way. You can see the roll maneuver, then we went into the very thin overcast and quickly popped out the top. The first stage, uh, of course, burned for about two, minute, two, two minutes and six seconds. Uh, I understand you had a good view of it as it came out the top of this cloud, a very spectacular shot. We were. Uh, uh, VFR on top, as the pilots say, uh, very quickly uh, with uh, very little actual instrument time. Like Gordo said, it was the uh, ride of a lifetime, uh, lots of vibration, lots of dynamics, and uh, uh, just a relentless push for eight and a half minutes into orbit. Uh, just was a continuous, uh, compelling, relentless acceleration and push all the way up there. We were able to perform our functions and talk and do our job, but we knew we had a tiger by the tail. 55 seconds, pass through Max-Q, still looking good. Throttling engines back to 100%. When the main engines ignited, there was a certain amount of shaking and rattling that was obvious. I was wondering if the solids had ignited, uh, but when they, when they uh, touch off, there's no doubt. There's uh, a tremendous uh, feeling of commotion and power down there behind you and a relentless push that is just adds up to the the ride of a lifetime. Uh, there's nothing that will ever even remotely approach the feeling of uh, first stage on the solids. Roger, we're looking. That was Jack uh, Lausma reporting a Freon loop light. One minute, 40 seconds, coming up on negative seats where altitude is too high for ejection seat use. Columbia Houston, negative seats. Negative seats. 
seats. Mark one minute, 55 seconds. Columbia now 21 nautical miles in altitude, 19 nautical miles down range. Two minutes, two seconds, standing by for solid rocket booster separation. This is a close-up picture of the uh, solid rocket motor breaking away from the uh, external tank. Okay, there's one, all three. Two minutes, 15 seconds, confirm solid rocket booster separation. Roger, Columbia, we confirm guidance converged. Two minutes, uh, seconds on we uh, we've got the separation of the sol uh, solid uh, rocket motors at two minutes and six seconds, and uh, we didn't feel it or hear it, but we did see that flash of flame around the cockpit as the uh, solid rockets were jettisoned and uh, parachuted into the ocean where they were picked up uh, uh, so that they can be refurbished and used again. Roger, two engine tail. Two minutes, 45 seconds. I'd call up by Capcom. Terry Hart says at Columbia and Allerton. It's Coming interesting that as soon as the solids uh, burn out and are jettisoned, uh, everything seconds, smooths Bay out absolutely as smooth as glass. Uh, it's, it's, it's the nicest ride, uh, smoother than any airliner any of you have ever flown on. Mark, 8 minutes, 30 seconds. Standing by now for main engine cutoff. Columbia now... Six there's Mako Houston, uh, 25.680 right on the button. And uh, 285 up. Roger, sounds like a good one. Eight minutes. Good attitude for step standing by. Eight minutes. Roger. Forty-six seconds. Uh, we uh, got the main engine cut off at eight minutes and thirty-four seconds. Uh, we waited for the external tank to be jettisoned. This is an underneath picture of the tank being jettisoned and uh, falling away from the spacecraft. Uh, uh, shortly thereafter, we ignited the uh, maneuvering engines to uh, put us into orbit. Uh, we made two firings of the uh, orbital maneuvering system. Uh, so after about uh, forty-five minutes, we were in orbit and able to open the payload bay doors. If you look quickly, uh, that's Los Angeles, the uh, South Bay, Palos Verdes Peninsula, then on down to San Diego. Then a few seconds later, that's the Salton Sea and the Imperial Valley in California, which greeted us as we uh, opened that first payload bay door. Okay, Houston, uh, we got the starboard door open, and uh, there goes the port door. And the uh, ohms pods look good, uh, tile-wise. We uh, don't see any marks there at all that uh, weren't there before we left. Roger. The uh, sight was ex as spectacular for us as it was uh, for you, and as you see it in these pictures here, it was uh, truly a... Uh, a momentous event for us and uh, most impressive uh, the pictures uh, and the memories don't do it justice you just have to go back and do it again in order to appreciate it fully the uh, morning of the first day was when we first uh, got the uh, the remotely controlled arm uh, made by the Canadians in the business Second day, actually, uh, Jack, if you remember. <laughs> uh, and Jack had discovered some tile missing out in front of the windshield. If you notice those uh, square, irregular uh, patches uh, in front of the windshield, those are actually missing white tile. So we moved the arm up uh, and got it over to the uh, right-hand side and looked along uh, on a kind of a grazing angle here, but had a view and found some more tile missing. Uh, however, those were, the, those were relatively insignificant. As it turned out, on entry, I've heard the number that the highest temperature noted on the top in the area of the missing tile was only 140 degrees or so. Actually, the tile didn't slow us down much. Uh, we knew that uh, lots of people would be concerned about it, and uh, so we uh, erased it from our thought and uh, went on to do the other business. Now an inside shot. I'm at the uh, manipulator operator station, and Jack has taken this movie right here as I uh, brought the plasma diagnostics package out of the payload bay for the first time. Okay, well, we got a capture of Apple. The induced environment contamination monitor was to be unberthed first on this flight. However, the arm's wrist camera malfunctioned, making viewing the contamination monitor very difficult since the plasma diagnostic package was also to be unberthed. 
and because its guideposts could easily be seen with the aid of binoculars, it was substituted for the contamination monitor. The plasma diagnostic package was one of ten instruments making up a scientific package on Flight 3 called OSS-1. We put the uh, manipulator arm through uh, the loaded operations, that is, with an attached payload for the first time in its uh, ever, uh, and exercised all the very complex sequences that the manipulator arm has built into it. Uh, some of those involve manually positioning the arm, others uh, with the software doing it automatically, and the, uh, our job merely to monitor uh, for safety considerations. Uh, we operated the arm night and day, so when the sun went down, we turned on lights in the payload bay and found that they were uh, adequate to see it visually as well as operate our television system. Periodically, it would uh, show up in the overhead window, as you see it pictured here, and uh, then it would be moved to the forward uh, uh, part of the spacecraft up over the nose to uh, make some measurements. And uh, it was spectacular to just to watch it uh, come real close and, uh, and uh, silently, uh, but smoothly move to its next point in the sequence. Seven auto trajectories, computer-controlled maneuvers of the arm on an invisible plot were evaluated on STS-3 using the plasma diagnostics package. At the same time, the experiment also measured changes in the plasma field in and around the payload bay as Columbia traveled through the ionosphere and monitored electromagnetic interference between the ionosphere and electronic equipment on board shuttle. The new knowledge will help scientists understand how larger celestial bodies move through plasmas and aid engineers in designing sensing equipment for future shuttle experiments. Several times during the mission, the arm and plasma diagnostic package operated in conjunction with a fast pulse electron generator to study the interaction of a stream of electrons emitted into the ionosphere. The result? a glow caused by atoms in the plasma being disturbed by the electron stream. Hopefully, this new knowledge will lead to a better understanding of how the same phenomena might occur in nature, for instance, in the aurora borealis. Other experiments studied the electrical buildup on the orbiter as it moved through the ionosphere, and contamination in and around the payload bay created by outgassings and thruster firings. These phenomena could affect scientific instruments and sensitive astronomy observations on future shuttle flights. Uh, we did have some venting from uh, one of the main engines uh, that uh, was with us for about uh, two to three days, which were reported, and uh, it was determined what the venting was. Uh, this is the way it looked, however, when the sunlight shone on it uh, with a dark background. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, after about two or three days, it went away. This is a picture that was taken uh, as we were going over the Baja Peninsula in an uh, ascending pass over the United States. I'm bringing the uh, plasma diagnostic package back in to latch it back down uh, in its uh, mounting mechanism. And this was one of the uh, big questions on the flight, how well that mechanism would work. Uh, we found that the task was much easier, uh, easier than it had been done during any of the ground tests. In fact, the whole thing, which had been anticipated and planned to take maybe as much as 30 minutes, we did on three separate occasions in uh, less than five minutes each time. The clearance between the plasma diagnostics package and the other experiments on the pallet was only two inches, a tight fit, but one which Fullerton was able to master within five minutes. And finally, uh, here you see the arm being put back down in its uh, cradle, its mounting mechanism, and this uh, in a backup mode, which is, uh, which is the, the crudest mode. One, if the whole primary system failed, we tested that backup mode and found that that whole thing of uh, cradling the arm and rolling it inboard, as uh, we're doing here, was uh, very easily done. Sally, uh, some general comments on the arm operation. Uh, I, uh, I'm really impressed with that piece of machine.
Hey, that's great news, and we were impressed, too. Although the astronauts had little appetite and difficulty sleeping their first two days in space, they gradually adjusted to the weightless environment. Lausma suffered motion sickness, and Fullerton experienced loss of appetite, a side effect of the motion sickness pill he took pre-flight. The flight surgeon prescribed food and sleep, and mission planners scheduled a less strenuous workload for flight day three so that the astronauts could recuperate. Eating was a real pleasure, uh, of course. <laughs> It's impossible to knock your milk off the table up there, kiddos. It's, there's no way to get in trouble with mom. Uh, you just uh, leave things float around, and when you want them, you just grab them out of thin air, and uh, you can eat standing on your head or uh, however you please. When you say eating was a real pleasure and you hear it from Jack Lossman, you can believe it. He really means it. <laughs> on board, research in life sciences involves several instruments which were stored on the mid-deck. The plant lignification and weightlessness experiment was a preliminary study of lignin growth in zero gravity. It is hoped that in the absence of gravity, woody plants might produce less lignin, an indigestible skeletal substance which provides upward growth, and instead produce digestible nutrients, such as proteins and carbohydrates. We had a number of uh, experiments in the cabin to, uh, to uh take care of. This is the plant growth unit that operated perfectly through the entire mission. We would read the uh, temperature in the uh, six plant growth compartments uh, three times a day and uh, read those back to the ground. A study of insects in flight was also done on STS-3. Commander Lausma prepared to examine the effects of weightlessness on some bees, moths, and flies. While on the ground, the principal investigator High school student Todd Nelson from Rose Creek, Minnesota, did the same. Todd, who designed and developed the experiment himself, was one of 10 finalists in the National Space Shuttle Student Involvement Project, a joint venture of NASA and the National Science Teachers Association. His experiment flew on STS-3. The other finalists' experiments will fly on later flights. The purpose of Todd's study was to compare the natural flight characteristics of three species with their behavior in zero gravity. The insects were chosen primarily because of their different wing sizes. Todd wanted to find out if that factor would affect their flight behavior in zero gravity. After recording his findings in the Earth's gravity, he watched the crew's report from space. Okay, hello there, space fans. Here we are in the uh, good ship Columbia, speeding over the United States at 150 miles, flying uh, pretty fast, uh, about five miles per second. But there are some among us who are actually flying faster than we are. And in this box, uh, they're not only flying along with us, but they are flying themselves. So they're uh, actually uh, going a lot faster than we, I think. Most of them have positioned themselves around the uh, uh, periphery of the box or fastened themselves onto something. And unless we agitate them a little bit and uh, make them get going. Now, it seems like the moths uh, are doing a little better than the bees. The bees are uh, uh, just sort of tumbling around without flapping their wings. But the uh, moths, uh, every once in a while, you can see that one flying right there. He uh, seems to have adapted to some degree to uh, zero gravity. And um, there are uh, a few bees like this one here. He's uh, just floating around. He's taking the easy way out like uh, Gordo is now. You don't see Gordo flapping his wings in zero G. Todd gathered much data from his experiment, and with the aid of his sponsor, the Avionics Division of Honeywell Incorporated, will report the findings in a paper to the National Science Teachers Association. The electrophoresis experiment verification test checked out the prototype of a more elaborate manufacturing device, which will be flown later on. The device separated chemical agents in fluids. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening and good afternoon, space fans. I'd like to tell you what we're doing here in the Space Shuttle Columbia. We're uh, speeding over the world at uh, about 17,500 miles per hour, now over the United States. And um, we're uh, doing some medical experiments, among other things. Uh, this one I have uh, right here is called an electrophoresis experiment. It simply uh, is a 
electrical way to separate out various chemical agents that uh, cannot be separated out very easily on the ground. And it's a very expensive process. However, in zero-G, these uh, chemical, chemical agents can be separated out and um, used for uh, various pharmaceutical and other medical purposes. But basically what we have here is um, a, a tube and process It's inside of this uh, container. And it was just like this, and it has a fluid inside, uh, which is actually a carrier for the uh, agent which is being separated out. We have a sample that we use to uh, place right in this slot in here. And the sample is uh, contained in the freezer. Inside of this freezer are uh, several small samples, which are used in this electrophoresis experiment. And then, once the experiment is processed, and the uh, various chemical agents are, are allowed to move along this tube and are separated out. Uh, when the process is completed in about an hour, then the whole sample is frozen and it is uh, then taken and placed back in this cryo freezer for um, analysis back on the ground. But um, this is a forerunner of a pharmaceutical experiment and uh, I think that this will be one of the um, major experiments and one of the major industrial uses of uh, space in the future is an area of uh, pharmaceuticals and uh, this is just a forerunner one and uh, it looks like it's working very well and uh, we'll have very promising results. So um, we're glad to have you with us today and we hope that uh, you will keep following the flight of the Columbia as we go on for the next week. Here comes the, the uh, studio TV technician down to put in a brief appearance here. Sally? Is that the vampire that goes with the uh, red blood cells? But like that. Here uh, I'm working the electrofluoresis experiment. Uh, I've taken one of the sample columns uh, mm -hmm. after it's been frozen in the, uh, in the uh, main apparatus and stowing it in a holder and putting it back in a uh, liquid nitrogen cooled uh, freezer that we had that kept that frozen throughout the uh, remainder of the flight and the trip back to Houston. In some of the most important tests of the mission, thermal soaks of Columbia, the vehicle was maneuvered into an attitude relative to the sun, which exposed the structure to either extremely hot or extremely cold temperatures. Mission controllers determined the effect of the soaks on the vehicle and its systems by monitoring the readings of temperature-sensitive instrumentation located at various places on the orbiter structure. They also devised a simple way to display the attitude of Columbia in relation to the sun, using a device called the thermodillo, so named because the object representing the orbiter is a popular animal in Texas, the armadillo. The position of the armadillo represented the attitude of the vehicle, and the flag reported its thermal status. The bottom part of the device, called the consumadillo, showed the status of consumables throughout the flight. After maintaining attitude for an extended period of time, the payload bay doors warped temporarily, which was expected because of the extreme temperatures encountered. To measure the exact amount of warpage, the doors were put in the closed position. And the amount of gap, or overlap, was measured by the crew using a theodolite instrument. Then the doors were reopened for the next thermal test. The astronauts reported much less warpage than was predicted by pre-flight engineering studies. Special measures will not need to be taken to cool down or warm up the doors before they can be closed.
One of the things we uh, really enjoyed the most about being there was the ability to get around uh, very quickly and easily. We could be anywhere in a spacecraft in a flash. And uh, this is the head first approach uh, down through the hatch and uh, down to the mid deck uh, where we had uh, these stowage lockers in which we had uh, lots of uh, apparatus, equipment, clothing, and uh, uh, books and other kinds of things that we needed. If you didn't like the head first approach, you could always do the feet first one and uh, glide down just about that quickly and uh, be right where mission control wanted you to be. And one of the things that you'd all enjoy is the ability to uh, manage uh, packages very readily and easily up there. No need to set anything down, you just uh, leave it float in space. The first zero-gravity treadmill was used on STS-3. It was designed by astronaut William Thornton to simulate running in an Earth gravity. Since the muscles do not have to work as hard in zero gravity, regular exercise must be maintained. Uh, we had an exerciser on board that we uh, used a couple of times and uh, we could uh, position ourselves on it. It was a treadmill which was self-propelled and uh, get our exercise with uh, no hands. Uh, in the 10 minutes I ran on this treadmill, I think uh, we should figure out the number. Something like uh, 3,000 miles we traveled. <laughs> Here's a man who ran 3,000 miles in just a few minutes. But this was a, a new device that was added for this flight, and uh, we think it uh, performed very well and be a good addition for uh, future flights. And uh, we used it uh, two different times. Uh, we took the whole exercise thing very seriously. As you'll see, uh, th this was not the only thing we did to keep in shape. Of course, you have to create work for yourself up in uh, space. Your body does less work uh, up there than it does when you're just lying in bed sleeping against the force of gravity. So we had to devise a number of uh, exercise routines. <laughs> weightlifting and balancing act here. <laughs> now, not many of you can do this right here. <laughs> he doesn't put them on one leg at a time like everybody else. As, as soon as I uh, get this down, I'm going to get a Dorothy Hamill wig and try out for the ice cream. <laughs> And, of course, Marines aren't happy unless they do their push-ups every day. <laughs> that wasn't too tough, so, uh, you know, look, one arm. <laughs> and if you want to, you can do foot-ups. <laughs> now, if you really got frustrated, you could do this. <laughs> For their welcome home, the crew wanted to look their best. With only one personal hygiene area on board, Jack and Gordon had to take turns. Here's a picture of Gordo uh, establishing himself in that area. And why don't you move the coat there, Gordo, and get it out of the way. Thank okay. you. <laughs> and of course, one of the things Gordo had to do was uh, brush his hair every morning. soap and uh, running water, so it was uh, very easy to uh, keep yourself clean. Back on Earth, winds were beginning to pick up at Northrop Strip. John Young, commander on STS-1, simulated the same approach to runway 23 that the astronauts might be attempting very shortly. Young reported to mission control. There's about two miles of visibility on runway 17 and one runway 23 is covered up in sand. I think we ought to knock this off, over. 
Okay, okay. okay. We got you, John. We copy and concur. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm you sorry, you guys. Not your fault. The wind was gusting over 50 knots. And deorbit burn to put Columbia in the correct attitude for entry into Earth's atmosphere was only 40 minutes away. Columbia, Houston, through Ascension, over. Ready, loud, clear, Steve, how are you? Roger, got, Roger, got you uh, five by, Jack. We uh, talked to the STA again between Bermuda and Ascension. And uh, as you could probably surmise, the winds have been coming up all day. Uh, it was still acceptable until uh, his last pass. But during uh, John's last pass, the uh, visibility were unacceptable and the turbulence was severe. So it's not a good day, and we're going to wave off for 24 hours. Over. Okay. Uh, we've had a good drill. The good drill showed once again the flexibility of the space transportation system. Flight controllers altered the flight plan just minutes before committing to entry. Columbia had enough fuel and other critical supplies to last at least 24 more hours. In fact, 72 more hours if necessary. Houston, Columbia. Roger, go ahead. Roger, go ahead, Gordo. Okay, we're looking straight down and north up. It looks a lot better today than it did yesterday. And it is a lot better there, Gordo. And uh, what kind of a turn are you betting on for 2-3 at this point, Steve? Okay, Jack, uh, first of all, you are go for the deorbit burn. And the winds right now are favoring runway 17 with a right turn. Okay, we're going to select that uh, runway 17 item 4 with uh, right hand turn. Hey, uh, that sounds good. We didn't do much work up there and finally came time to come home. So we uh, got the payload bay doors closed and, uh, and uh, got a wave off for mission control. But uh, finally the next day they decided they'd bring us in anyway. And uh, here are a few shots that uh, many of you were able to witness from the ground. Columbia, Houston, through Buckhorn, configure AOS. Okay, we're reading you loud and clear. Uh, we got the PTI so far, and uh, take a look at our uh, ground tracking now, please. Roger, uh, energy and ground track are good, and NAV is great, Jack. That's good news, Steve, thank you. This is really a beautiful flying machine. Columbia, Houston, have an update on winds and weather when you're ready. Go ahead. Roger, a high scattered cirrus deck over the field. Surface winds 180 at 11, altimeter 3003. Over. Okay, I got him. The uh, airplane was flown uh, manually uh, from uh, about 40,000 feet down to about 10,000 feet. Here's a picture out Gordo's window of what uh, he saw from inside. We're just uh, rolled into the right bank, turning uh, the 90 degree turn from our approach heading onto final approach. The uh, entry was as spectacular as the boost was uh, in terms of dynamics and, uh, and sensation and uh, excitement and high adventure. It uh, was a machine that slowed down from 25 times the speed of sound to zero in about uh, 25 to 30 minutes. It felt like it just had the brakes on all the way and uh, we had uh, one of the uh, most spectacular quick tours at low altitude and high speed of the United States anybody will ever have. And as you uh, see the white sands come into view and look closely, the uh, runway will become visible, but then uh, go out of sight again. There's the, the approach to the runway right there. But uh, because of the uh, strong westerly wind, we had to crab to the right. Right now, Jack is engaging the audio system, and you can see it making a, a quick correction to the right, then back to the left. But with that uh, correction for the wind drift, it's hiding the view of the runway until we get down here a little closer and you'll be able to see our aim point come into view. 288. Body flaps and trail. Roger.
5,000 feet. You'll see a triangle and a rectangle. We are actually aiming for the rectangle, and there's some lights in there, not readily visible till just about now, that helped us uh, determine that the guidance system had us exactly on the uh, proper glide slope. Okay, uh, we got it firmly established on the uh, inner glide slope, and um, and uh, then took over manually and uh, made the landing, and the. Uh, and the rollout. We used the whole runway, although we didn't have to. It would have been possible to have uh, stopped much sooner had it been uh, necessary. And uh, here is a final shot of the uh, uh, final part of the approach. Uh, Gordo got the wheels down at 275 knots, uh, right on the money. And uh, we uh, broke the rate of descent right in here and uh, then landed and uh, made the rollout. I noticed that the uh, wheels, nose wheel was going down a little uh, more quickly than I wanted it to and uh, had to hold it off some. In doing so, I uh, over-rotated a little bit, kind of popped a wheelie there, but uh, no harm done. In the lapse time of touchdown, uh, unofficially, eight days, zero hours, four minutes, 49 seconds. The uh, Columbia made a good smooth rollout. Uh, at the end of it, we made a little nose wheel steering test and uh, stopped it uh, before the end of the, the uh, uh, drawn out runway. Although, as I mentioned, uh, we just used very light braking and could have stopped it much more quickly. Okay, Columbia, welcome home. That was a beautiful job. Convoy 1, uh, Columbia, Ridge Line, clear, how many? Welcome home. Area 5, square 2. Uh, finally, they uh, decided to let us out, in spite of the fact that we wanted to stay a little longer, and met the sunshine there at White Sands Missile Range. And uh, uh, we have apparently picked the right time to come because the wind kind of abated and let up for us, although it picked up later. The support at uh, White Sands was uh, incredible, and uh, it was a great team effort uh, with uh, NASA, contractor people, and the Department of Defense to provide a landing opportunity there in a very short time. So it's a tribute to our whole American team for the way that the final part of our flight worked out. STS-3 was the most successful mission of the flight test program so far. Four months before liftoff, the launch date of March 22, 1982 was established. And on that date, Columbia was launched. Mission planners were able to exchange day four for day three. And Columbia showed its capacity to remain on orbit longer than planned. STS-3 has clearly demonstrated the versatility and flexibility of the space transportation system. It has brought us one step closer to the beginning of a new era, routine operational spaceflight.